and he's taken this commentator at Cambridge, took the themes. Did you know that the prophets speak of very little else than these two topics? How and why God's people may be expected to be punished by a variety of disasters soon, and why they may expect to be rescued and eventually restored. That's wonderful, isn't it? Pick up Isaiah. It's all about that. It's gloom and doom now. You haven't seen anything until you've seen the kingdom. When you can stop whatever laws you don't like, you're going to put an end to that, and you're going to achieve it. Bring my enemies in front of me. Excuse me? How many times has the pastor preached on that? Vengeance is mine. I will eventually repay. So there's coming a time of judgment. I see that. So then he goes through Ezekiel. He says Ezekiel is occupied with two great themes. Very easy. Two great themes. The destruction of the city and the nation and the reconstitution of the people and their eternal peace. P-E-A-C-E. -E. This book falls into two equal divisions, 24 chapters each. Isn't that wonderful for your children? 24 chapters is awful. 24 chapters is going to be great. That makes a story easy to read, doesn't it? I can, I can pick up the book of Isaiah. I can't put it down. It's so exciting, so thrilling, because it breaks your heart to see where the world has got to. Horrible. But, you, but now the point we're getting to this afternoon, we could do the same with the book of Zephaniah quickly. The book of Zephaniah falls into two general divisions. Chapters 1 to 3, 8, a threat of judgment on the world. And secondly, a promise of salvation, equally universal, chapter 3, 9 to 20. Same with Jeremiah. For thus says the Lord, just as I thought that I would bring this great disaster on this people, so I'm going to bring on them all the good which I'm promising them. Finally, in Isaiah 9, there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. That's rather straightforward, isn't it? I didn't know any of this in my CV days. We didn't talk about any of that. So that's exciting. The world's destiny. Very simple. It's a bad scene now, but it's going to be wonderful in the future. Paling in Asia. Palin, Greek for, again, Yenesia, birth. Acts 3.21. Heaven must retain the Son of Man until, until, until the apokatastasis, the standing up again of everything that's fallen down. It's the same theme. God has not been so cruel to us to give us a Bible that nobody can read. What good is a revelation that nobody understands? It's not that hard. There are difficult passages. We might even go to Hebrews 1.10. Difficult passage. You, Lord, in the beginning, laid the foundation of the world. What? That's addressed to Jesus, the Son. That's difficult. Most of this is not difficult. Kingdom is coming, go for it. Somebody mentioned this morning, a Jew said exactly that. You know what a Jew in the synagogue would have prayed along with Jesus? May your kingdom be established speedily in my life. Does that sound like anything you've heard before? What people don't like is the Jews. It's a whole exercise in anti-Semitism. Luther said, ask your Lutheran friends if they know this. Luther said, burn the synagogues, kill the Jews. I'm not sure if I want to be a Lutheran. Calvin burns Servetus, you guys, at the stake, slowly. Green sticks. Calvinism, I'd, I'd run a mile from that. That presents God as having determined before you were born what you're going to do, nothing to do about it, and you'll be tortured forever and ever and ever and ever. I don't think people are thinking in church, are they? Group think. Well, everybody believes it, so it's got to be true. There's some unknown me, and I don't understand it, mostly in my genes from family. The whole art of living was, you've got to try to figure this out. What does this mean? What does this mean? 40,000 denominations. I don't get it. That makes no sense. I wish above all things, Paul said in 1 Corinthians, that you all say the same thing, that you be perfectly united in one mind. Are we there? That's the prophets then. Four main topics. The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a bad scene. God's going to punish the world. He already drowned all the world except eight people, apparently. Now he's going to punish the world. And there's always going to be a remnant, though. There are always a few favored uh, people who survive that thing. The third main topic is the Messianic king. Mary had a baby. Let's do Luke 2.11. Luke, our brother Luke, who wrote more of the New Testament than anybody else, if you exclude Hebrews. So in Luke 2.11, what is the birth certificate of Jesus in Luke 2.11? You all know it? It's fine. You've got something to learn here. Luke 2, 11 is beautiful. Today is born for you in the city of Bethlehem, Bethlehem, one who is going to be called the Christos Kyrios, the Christ Lord, not the God Lord. Nobody thought God could be born. You're smiling, but your friends are not. Can God be born? Can God die? Can the immortal die? They sing hymns about the immortal dies. They believe that Jesus had a beginningless beginning, 
That's what they believe your friends are. Don't bother to find out. They wouldn't bother to think about church, would they? Or the creeds or anything. They say that Jesus was man, but not a man. I think the church fathers were very disturbed. They needed psychiatric help. How could you say that? A beginningless beginning. What is a beginningless beginning? What if that's nonsense? How well are you going to do in Judgment Day presenting your case to Jesus? Well, I, I preach nonsense. Okay, come in. Great. Kingdom's right here. <sighs> I don't know how that goes exactly. So the Messianic King, and for the fourth main topic of the prophets is the inviolability of Jerusalem. That sounds to me awfully like a city on the earth, doesn't it? Mount Zion. It will be the capital, said this commentary of, a, uh, commentary, of a new world order, what in the book of Hebrews 2.5 is called the inhabited earth of the future. Wow, I never heard that in a funeral sermon. Where did you get that from, Jesus might say. Why didn't you learn that the meek are going to inherit the earth and live in it forever? And we did mention in that question time, the resurrections. You know that Revelation 20 verse 5 says the rest of the dead did not get resurrected till what? The end of the thousand years. All right, J.W. did it all. Ah, no good. I don't believe it. Wait a minute, you're coming to the public as Christian teachers. Can't you read Revelation 20 verse 5? The rest of the dead did not get resurrected till the end of the thousand years. Then they did. And then when that happened, some of those got written in the book of life. How was that possible? They weren't in the first resurrection, but by some means they managed to get their names eventually in the second resurrection inscribed into the book of life. That's hopeful. Maybe they're among those people who did things by nature, good things, and God didn't hold that against them. I don't know exactly. You know, I'm waiting for some of you to, to write all that out, but that's, that's rather hopeful. So I'm giving you the general scheme here. You can read any translation. New American Standard Version is good. King James, no. Too old. Too archaic. You don't speak to your children, thee and thou. Beautiful language. Consider the lilies of the field, how they spin. No. Consider the lilies of the field, how they, they toil not, neither do they spin. But I tell you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of those flowers. That's beautiful. But your child's not going to be impressed with these and thous and all that. So read them a modern translation. New American Standard Update will be fine. Because this is life. If this isn't life, what is? What is? Show me something better. All right, so we talked then about the wider hope. Let me just make that absolutely clear. The principle is this, that God wants everybody to be saved. 1 Timothy 2.5. It's God's desire for everybody to be saved. And you could argue, if that's so, then everybody has to be saved. Oh, you could argue that since we have free will, some choose not to be. But that's a clear statement. God desires everybody to be saved. However, all these people in Fiji, born before Jesus, did they ever hear of Jesus? Of course not. So in the resurrection, second resurrection, they come up, trillions of them, billions of them, and God says, you didn't believe in my son, or you believed in the pre-existence of my son, you're out of here, burn him up. That doesn't make any sense to me at any level. Therefore, the wider hope says they must be given a probation based on what they could reasonably know and no more. If I had not come and spoken to you, Jesus said, you wouldn't be guilty. Ooh, I get that. That's a powerful verse. It's in John 15, twice over. He said to the Pharisees, but now that I've told you, watch out. Be careful how you hear, Jesus said. Be careful what you're exposed to because you're going to be guilty if you don't go with what you've learned. If they believed in the kingdom, they could repent. That's staggering, isn't it? That's why the beginning, let's talk about the beginning now. I hear people saying, well, Christianity began at the cross. It's false, 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 wrong, wrong, wrong. It began with John the Baptist. Luke 16, 16 says, the law and the prophets were until John the Baptist. From that time onwards, the kingdom of God is being preached. So that's Christianity. Didn't begin with the cross, began with John the Baptist. And so important is that in Acts 10, Peter said the same thing. It says he opened his mouth, which is solemn discourse. And he gives the same scheme. That John the Baptist came first, preaching and announcing, heralding. He was the greatest man ever, wasn't he? The least in the kingdom will be greater than he. And your brother was there the other day. And I appealed to him. I don't know if I know what that means. It sounds like John the Baptist was the greatest man ever. And yet the least in the future kingdom will be greater than John the Baptist. Whoa. John the Baptist is heralding the Messiah. He actually baptized Jesus. What? How would you like to baptize Jesus? And John, of course, baptized people too. That was the baptism of John. In Acts 19, that wasn't good enough. So Paul baptized them again. Have you thought about that? Anybody get baptized again? When we can, our Armstrong want to wash clean, so we started all over. 
Jan Gilded and many of our friends have chosen, we can't tell you what to do, they've said, now that I've got I clear, God is one, gospel's about the kingdom, now it's ready to be baptized. Some people choose to do that. You don't want to baptize yourself, though, because people phone and say, shall I baptize myself in the bathtub? No, I wouldn't do that. Well, shall I go to my Trinitarian pastor? I, I wouldn't do that either. I love the theology of Jesus. He's a, the a theologian. And Deuteronomy 18 you know, says, if you don't listen to this final prophet of mine, you're in trouble. Like you're out of here. If you will not listen to the words, the words, the words, the words of Jesus, the name of the gospel of the kingdom, second resurrection, some people get written into the book of life. They weren't in the first resurrection. So my concept is this. When Jesus appears, one parousia, one parousia, one second coming, not two. At Dallas Theological Seminary, you've got two parousias, one seven years before the other. We do believe in the future 70th week. I think that's clear. However, the parousia is at the end of it, after the Great Tribulation. That doesn't mean to say you have to go and suffer the Great Tribulation. You could escape in your house, Jesus said, flee to the hills. But don't expect to be wafted off to heaven before the Great Tribulation. In America, everybody believes that, right? So the Great Tribulation is the greatest time of suffering. You all know where that is, right? Your neighbors are saying, oh, show me, where's this Great Tribulation? You all say what? Jeremiah what? 1331. You're going to have to do lots of Bible teaching, and then you'll very soon learn how these things go. So it's, it's a time of Jacob's trouble, but he's going to be saved from it, and there's going to be terrible suffering. And then in Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, cosmic signs, then they will see the Son of Man coming in power and glory. Is that clear or whatever? Or what? Immediately after... The commentaries are struggling with that. Oh, what in the world is that? Matthew got it wrong. Poor old Matthew got confused, edited the thing wrong. <laughs> no. The future Great Tribulation is to be followed immediately by the heavenly signs and the parousia. So the moment that Jesus appears in the sky, I think he's going to immortalize you. That's the seventh trumpet. At that moment, you're going to be changed from mortal into immortal, and then you're going to proceed to take charge of the world with Jesus. Wow. Probably you'd have a messianic banquet on it, probably. And then maybe Jesus will come from the east, west towards Jerusalem and place his feet on the Mount of Olives, just like David did, took over from the Jebusites, with a very great privilege, because God looks on the hearts of you and says, well, these people are amazing. Look what they've suffered through. <laughs> they've been J-dubs, you know, they've suffered from this, that. They've been a Roman Catholic, that didn't work, and they tried this. Here they are. So, all right, I'll show you what I'm going to do for them. I'm going to give them the world, Jeremiah 27, 5. So take charge of five cities. Well done. And people say, oh, poor little me, I can do nothing. No, God is more excited about your talent than you are. It's, I, I get the God bit, but I, some people are very self-deprecating. <laughs> poor little me, I'm this miserable sinner, you know, if I could just hold the door for a thousand. No, 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 no. You're not going to be excited holding the door for a thousand years, are you? What an awful prospect. You can do that now at a movie theater, and if you want to hold the door for ten minutes, you'll be bored with it. No, take charge of... Ten cities, five cities, and let's fix this mess. It's going to take a while. It will not happen. People have this idea, the millennium transforms the world in ten minutes. Okay, so when, when the world will learn righteousness, Isaiah 26, 9. The inhabitants of the earth, even the Brits and the Australians, are going to have to learn to do life right. That will mean that sex belongs in marriages. It means you don't have children out of wedlock. Where would you get teaching that now? That's a disaster. You've got a nest to put the child in. I mean, that's, that's a tragedy for the child. Or you don't want the baby, so you're going to kill it. What? I don't think so. And recently on our own circle, they've been arguing about, there's only one verse against abortion in the Bible. That is absolute nonsense. They quoted the one from Leviticus where if, if a, a woman gets injured, you know, accidentally, that's the only verse that says anything about abortion. It's not. I came back and said, have you noticed the word brephos in Greek? is an infant in the womb and out of the womb, both. So the same word is prephos. It's an unborn child and a born child. Actually, I mean, let me be explicit here. If you really think that abortion is a good idea, I don't think you've really come to theism. I mean, there's something missing in your makeup. So let's have mercy on, on living people. Why not? Better still, let's not, not have you know, children that aren't wanted. Or if you do have them, they're always adoptable. I mean, I'm living in a house for two or three days with two amazing adopted children. That's, that's a miracle to me. It's just wonderful. I love it. Okay, so um, 
Let me show you then Luke 17 a moment on this kingdom thing. You've got this famous question in verse 20. Now, having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, it's a good question, wasn't it? They didn't think it had come. They got questioned. When I was teaching at the American school, I can't say to this audience, your American school, American, your American school in London, marvelous job, where the Texas boy said, Banjur, Mr. Buzzer, and I gave up and turned into theologian instead. But when I was going to that school in London, the American school in London, St. John's Wood, St. John's Wood, St. John's Wood, went in there every day, and there were always Salvation Army people on the train station. So I would go up to them and say, I'm, I'm writing on this subject. Could you tell me, what is the kingdom of God? What did they say? Invariably, the kingdom of God is within you. Oh, almost certainly a mistranslation in the King James. King of God's in your heart. The devil doesn't like that kingdom. He wants to hide it in your heart as just a good feeling. Surely the presence of the kingdom is here. I, I grant you that. The spirit of the kingdom. You're the royal family in training. You are the kingdom. But the kingdom of God, proprement dit, as the French would say, properly speaking, is that thing for which Jesus was praying in the Son of God, right? May your kingdom be established speedily. Thy kingdom come. Jesus was a Jew. And he answered them in verse 20 of Luke 17, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. There you go, just in your heart. Read on. Nor will they say, meaning nor should they say, look here or there, because the kingdom of God is in your midst, is possible. I'm the king, and I'm right here, and you're missing it. Better still, the kingdom of God will be all over, not local, when it comes. Richard Hyers from Harvard helped us with this one. So they will not say, let's go to the out in the wilderness to find the kingdom. Let's go over here to find... No, no. When it comes, it will be what? Like lightning flashing from east to west. It will be not local, but universally seen by everybody. It's probably the best meaning there. Certainly not with the King James. It's in your heart. So that, that's a stumbling block for people. You can say that 95%, 98% of all the kingdom verses are future in the New Testament. In Mark, for instance, none of them are future. At uh, present, sorry. In Mark, none of them are present kingdom like the kingdom of God is is right now here in your midst. Some in Luke, very few in Luke, very few in Matthew. Proprement dit, I like the French there. Properly speaking, right? The kingdom is future. And you tell your friends, you've been saying that. May your kingdom spread? No. May your kingdom come. Because you're so heartbroken at the world. But in Daniel 7.13, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold... That's the asterisk word in the Bible, right? Watch out. Behold, look here. Don't miss this. Behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a human being, like a son of man. Why? Because in his glorified state, he's more than what you look like. He's like a son of man. He is a son of man. He is the son of man. And here he's like a son of man, glorified human being. He was coming and he came to the Ancient of Days. That would be God, the Father, the one with the white hair and was presented, that's a, that's a royal, you know, you get presented to the queen. So the Son of Man is presented to the Father. That's the going up part of it. Now 14, to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, there's the gospel, so that all people's nations and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. That's the kingdom of God, that's the core of the gospel, isn't it? That's beautiful. Kingdom, empire, not just something in your heart. We'll finish with this at the end of 7. This is 7.27. Let me read from 24 onwards. The ten horns in this beast out of this kingdom are ten kings. So you've got ten rulers at the end. Confederation of ten. Psalm 93. You've got ten. Assyria is chief. Assyrian has a big part to play in this. Who will arise and there will be another one. That's 11 if you can add ten and one. And he gets rid of three, so you're reduced to eight. Is that right? My mathematics is hopeless. But something like that. But Jesus is going to fight a confederation of ten. Psalm 83, including the Syrian. And he will be different from the other ones and will subdue three. I get it. 25, will speak out against the Most High. And watch out for this. Wear, wear down the saints. Your friends can exhaust you. They can, with opposition. Wear down the saints. Uh, he will be different and will subdue three kings. He will speak out against the Most High. That's God. And wear down the saints of the highest one. You're the saints. You are the saints. Doesn't mean sinless, but you're the holy people of God from every nation, international church. 
And what happens then? And he will intend to make alterations in time, whatever that is. He alters the law in some way. I'll, I'll wait and see. I don't know exactly what that means. And they, the saints, will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. It's got to be seven years. Three and a half years, sorry. It's got to be half of a heptad. Three and a half years. I think so. But here's the good news. 26. The court will sit for judgment. And his, the Antichrist's dominion, will be taken away, annihilated, destroyed forever. Thank goodness, you sigh, sigh of relief, right? It's all over, coming all over. Then 27, easy, three times three times three, got it? Three times three times three, very final. I love that 27, like Luke 19, 27, bring my enemies in front of me and slaughter them. I don't like that one at all. But this 27 is very good. Nine times three, or three times three times three. Then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven. Your child too understands that, don't they? Under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the holy ones, the saints, that's you, you're the saints, of the highest one of God. It should read, their kingdom, not his kingdom, their kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all the dominions will serve and obey them. Translations are foggy there. They don't want you to think of that. Oh, we'll serve God and Jesus. I get that. No, serve you. Can you, can you bear that? They're going to have to do what you say. What? That's extraordinary to me. And in the Lord's Supper, Luke 22, 29, you don't know this from your translation, but it's right there in the Greek. I, Jesus, covenant to give you a kingdom, just as my Father covenanted. So the gospel of the kingdom is the new covenant, the gift of the kingdom to you in preparation. That's the whole new covenant. We only discovered that six months ago. That's staggering. The translations are trying to play tricks on you in various places. What a covenant. That's the covenant of the gospel of the kingdom, the Vasilia, the Evangelion. 